Hello beautiful people and welcome to Poet Perspective number 54. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lish, your MC for the evening. Uh, we have a very exciting night for you tonight uh, with our feature Sean M. Whelan. He is the king of cool and he is an amazing poet and has a beautiful, beautiful warm heart. So we're in for a real treat tonight listening to Sean. And the open section is going to be pretty groovy as well. We have Meg Dunn and Justin Godden and several other fine poets. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Hello everyone, uh, my name's Michael Reynolds and I'd like to share with you a poem uh, that I found in a book by Yevgeny Yevtushenko, the Russian poet, um, out of his book called Invisible Threads, published in 1980. Uh, turns out he was a bit of a um, keen photographer, actually. Most of the book is uh, has got uh, pics that he took in his travels of ordinary people, ordinary scenes, and there's even a picture of a dead kangaroo. Look at that. There you go. Um, the poem that I'd like to read is called I Would Like, and it does contain the word um, wog, uh, but just take it in the context of the times and, and the poem. So here we go. It's called I Would Like. I would like to be born in every country, have a passport for them all to throw the foreign office into a panic, be every fish in every ocean, and every dog in the streets of the world. I would rather be a dog among dogs than in a foreign country a wog among wogs. I don't want to bow down before any idols or play at being a Russian Orthodox church hippie, but I would like to plunge deep into Lake Baikal and surface snorting somewhere. Why not in the Mississippi? In my damn beloved universe, I would like to be a lonely weed, but not a delicate pansy, in both meanings. I would like to be any of God's creatures, right down to the last mangy hyena, but never a tyrant, or even the cat of a tyrant. I would like to be reincarnated as a man in any image, a victim of prison torture, a homeless child in the slums of Hong Kong, a living skeleton in Bangladesh, a holy beggar in Tibet, a black in Cape Town, but never in the image of a bastard. I would like to lie under the knives of all the surgeons in the world, hunchbacked, blind, suffer all kinds of diseases, wounds and scars, be a victim of war or a sweeper of dog ends, just so a filthy microbe of sick. Superiority doesn't creep inside. I would not like to be in the elite, nor, of course, in the cowardly herd, nor a guard dog of that herd, nor a shepherd sheltered by that herd, and I would like happiness, but not at the expense of the unhappy. And I would like freedom, but not at the expense of the unfree. I would like to love all the women in the world. And I would like to be a woman too, just once. Men have been diminished by Mother Nature. Why don't you give motherhood to men? If an innocent child stirred below his heart, men would probably not be so cruel. I would like to be man's daily bread, say, a cup of rice for a Vietnamese woman in mourning, or an onion in the slops of a prison cheap wine in a Neapolitan worker's trattoria, or a tiny tube of cheese in orbit around the moon. Let them eat me. Let them drink me, if my death will be of some use. I would like to belong to all times. Shock all history so much that it was amazed at what a smart aleck I was. Saw up Stenka Razin's wooden cage. Save Mary Stewart's fragile neck from that impolite axe. Bring Nefertiti to Pushkin on a traitor. 
I would like to increase the space of a moment a hundredfold so that in that same moment I could drink vodka with fishermen in Siberia, kiss in Liverpool, whispering Liverpudlian, and sit together with Homer, Dante, Shakespeare and Tolstoy, drinking anything except, of course, Coca-Cola. Dance to the tom-toms in the Congo, Strike at Renault. Chase a ball with Brazilian boys at Cabana Beach. I'd like to know every language, like the secret waters under the earth, and do all kinds of work at once. I would like to make sure that one Yevtushenko was merely a poet, the second an underground fighter somewhere, the third a student at Berkeley, the fourth a jolly Georgian drinker, and the fifth may be a teacher of Eskimo children in Alaska. The sixth, a young president somewhere, say even in Sierra Leone. The seventh would still shake a rattle in his pram. And the tenth, the hundredth, the millionth, for me, it's not enough to be myself. Let me be everyone. Every living creature usually has a mate. But God was stingy with the carbon paper and in his Paradise Publishing Corporation made a unique copy of me, but I shall muddle up all God's cards. I shall confound God. I shall be in a thousand copies to the end of my days so that the earth buzzes with me and computers go berserk in the world census of me. I would like to fight on all your barricades, humanity. Nestle against the Pyrenees, swim across the Sahara and take on the faith of the great brotherhood of man. And when I die a smart Alex, Siberian Francois Villon, do not lay me in the earth of France or Italy, but in our Russian Siberian earth on a still green hill where I first felt that I was everyone. Yevgeny Yevtushenko. Cheers. You wanted to study your stars, the guards of your prison yard, their zodiac, the planets, muttered the Babylonish power spratch. Like a witch doctor's bones, you were right to fear how loud the bones might roar, how clear an ear might hear what the bones whispered, even embedded as they were in the hot body. Only you had no need to calculate degrees for your ascendant disruptor in Aries. It meant nothing certain, no more, according to the Babylonian book, than a scarred face. How much deeper under the skin could any magician peep? You only had to look into the nearest face of a metaphor, picked out of your wardrobe or off your plate, or out of the sun or the moon or the yew tree, to see your father, your mother or me bringing you your whole fate. Mother Teresa and the Virgin Mary, Christian brothers, the nuns that are scary, watching the altar boys while the choir sings. These are a few of George Pell's favourite things. Hating transsexuals while he's wearing dresses, not passing on what a pedo confesses, counting the gold out and kissing Pope's rings. These are a few of George Hell's favourite things. Expensive lawyers and friends in high places. Victims ashamed to be showing their faces. Eating the flesh and the blood of his king. These are a few of George Pell's favourite things. When his priests are getting rapey, everyone gets mad. But he ships them off to some new far-flung place and then the church won't look bad. Putting the church above its congregations, helping aid spread through the African nations, shaming young people for masturbating. These are a few of George Pell's favourite things. 
all of the splendour of your midnight masses, cherubic faces and pert little asses, angels that soar but have blood on their wings. These are a few of George Pell's favourite things. Legally guilty or not, I do not care. If hell was real, you would surely be going there. For causing such terrible suffering, George, you are really a horrible thing. Now the verdict is not guilty. When I'm feeling sad, I simply remember his one year in jail and I don't feel quite so bad. Uh, happy Tuesday, everybody. Thanks for being with us again. Uh, it's been a great couple of online poultry perspectives, and I hope you're enjoying tonight as well. I'm Matt O'Keefe. I run uh, Pride of Our Footscray, of course, and thank you for being with us. Thanks, Talish, for hosting again and get well soon. Um, and uh, thank you to Colin, of course, for the amazing video work, which... Uh, it takes a lot of time, but uh, makes us all appear better than what we are, and uh, uh, it's uh, we're very grateful to him. Um, I'm going to read two poems tonight. Um, one uh, by uh, Sean O'Callaghan, who is just a riot, uh, and also one from myself. It is the third poem that I have ever written, and uh, I hope everybody enjoys it, especially Waffle Iron Girl. Um, and now I'll read the poems. Okay, so this poem is one that I've written, um, and it is called, Yes Sir, The Enemy Is Contained. For some people, their enemy in life is boredom. For others, Ambition is the killer. My enemy is time. Relentless, unforgiving time. It marches on and on and on. Without fear, without regret. With sympathy, hitherto, undetected. My enemy has never been killed, nor contained. But welcome back, an old player onto the battlefield, resplendent in a new form, having been thought vanquished, microscopic in size, an RNA strand its only weapon, a protein its only defence, but with a fiendish ability to recruit and a devilish ability to incapacitate its targets. The force of virus is most definitely back. Soldier, please provide a status report. Humans contained. Time contained. So we now have space away from time in which I can prepare the realms of scripts I owe the Kaiser. Yes, sir. The enemy is contained. Thanks, everybody. That was, yes, sir. The enemy has been contained. This poem is called Uncle Bernie. Um, it, it is by Sean O'Callaghan from the book Sean O'Callaghan, an instant classic. Uncle Bernie. It was about five o'clock in the morning and uh, nowhere else to go except the gay club down the street. So any port in a storm... 
Inside, out back, uh, where the screen on the wall showed a fire, a man called me over and said I looked like I needed a hug, which I did. He said that he was called Uncle Bernie, and the, he would look after me, and he had lots of drugs back at his house. And I said to him, do I look like a tart to you, mate? And he just walked away and left me standing there feeling penetrated. And that's Uncle Bernie. Not a great fella. Thanks for being here. Lake bathing in the Japanese garden. Lake bathing this morning. No mirror could show me my soul more clearly. At a loss, for all words reflect the casual tumble of water. Lone duck, just one part of the perspective, dives in. Below, green weed beckons, my head nods. Flick sprays, twinkling diamonds from my lashes, drips to cheeks, breasts, I stand. Tall white gum. Tall white gum, bending just a little. Stunning the gardener, chainsawing with earmuffs on. Deaf to me, all eyes, he stops. In Zen, a man has no mind apart from what he knows and sees. This woman glistens. In desire, a man has no mind. Karawans jolt the sky, rosellas in their wake. Stepping stones, we want to run. Each is the other at once, go plunging in the depths. Find the air. Ducks fly up, new feathers. Small waterfall recalls the mountain torrents. Line by grain in the tea house pavilion, strong torso, little bell breasts, mapping the sea of sand. In Zen, in man, in woman, in Zen. Later, it gets later by osmosis. It transpires, it is a tidal lake. We swim. The lake's form follows the character of the heart or soul. Hi, my name's Robin, and tonight I'd like to read to you a classic Australian poem, Clancy of the Overflow. Clancy of the Overflow was written by Banjo Patterson, a famous Australian poet. He was a lawyer who lived and worked in Sydney. Uh, he was also a journalist and an author and a poet. Uh, and whilst he lived in Sydney, he adored the outback and spent a lot of time in New South Wales and Queensland. You may know him better as the author of the song lyrics to Walsy Matilda and he also wrote Man from Snowy River. I first, I would have first heard this poem back in school many, many, many years ago. Um, but my favourite version, I mean, there have been many that's been recorded, both in poem form and song form, but my favourite version was done by the famous Australian band, the Bushwhackers, the great Bushwhacker band, um, back in 1976 on their album called And the Band Played Walsing Matilda. I can highly recommend it. Anyway, here we go tonight, Clancy of the Overflow. I had written a little letter, which I had, for want of better knowledge, sent to where I met him down the Lachlan years ago. He was shearing when I knew him, so I sent the letter to him just on spec, addressed as follows. Clancy of the Overflow. And an answer came directed in a writing unexpected. And I think the same was written with a thumbnail dipped in tar. 
"'Twas his shearing mate who wrote it, and verbatim I will quote it. Lance is gone to Queensland driving, and we don't know where he are. In my wild, erratic fancy, visions come to me of Clancy, gone a-droving down the Cooper where the western drovers go. As the stock are slowly stringing, Clancy rides behind them singing, for the drover's life has pleasures that the townsfolk never know. And the bush hath friends to meet him, and their kindly voices greet him in the murmur of the breezes and the river on its bars. And he sees the vision splendid of the sunlit plains extended, and at night the wondrous glory of the everlasting stars. I am sitting in my dingy little office, where a stingy ray of sunlight struggles feebly down between the houses tall, and the fetid air and gritty of the dusty, dirty city, through the open window floating, spreads its foulness over all. And in place of lowing cattle, I can hear the fiendish rattle of the tramways and the buses making hurry down the street, and the language uninviting of the gutter children fighting comes fitfully and faintly through the ceaseless tramp of feet. And the hurrying people daunt me, and their pallid faces haunt me, as they shoulder one another in their rush and nervous haste, with their eager eyes and greedy, and their stunted forms and weedy. For townsfolk have no time to grow, they have no time to waste. And I somehow rather fancy that I'd like to change with Clancy, like to take a turn at droving where the seasons come and go, while he faced the round eternal of the cash book and the journal. But I doubt he'd suit the office, Clancy of the Overflow. So thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode tonight. Thank you. Some rockets rumble, some rockets crackle, the biggest rockets rumble, crackle and roar. The best pens have a rocket shape. A spindle shoots towards space on a column of cloud. Russian smokeless rockets emit a fancy butane lighteresque exhaust. Up in smoke, booster rocket bungles. This rocket rolls, trajectory true, through orbital windows. Parabolic rockets frolic with space junk. Falcon heavy boosters land like thunderbirds on a rescue mission. Requiem for retro rockets. A rocket arises from a field of rocket Godzilla gimbals. Humans are sometimes classified as rocket components. The Odyssey Wars. But self-possessed Tully Marcus drew the line. Artinous, now how could I dine with you in peace and take my pleasure? You ruffians carousing there. Isn't it quite enough that you, my mother's suitors, have rented it all? My very best these many years while I was still a boy. But now that I'm full grown and can hear the truth from others, absorb it too. Now, yes, the anger sees inside me. I'll stop at nothing to hurl destruction at your heads. Whether I go to Pilos or sit tight here at home, but the trip I speak of will not end in failure. Go, I will, as a passenger, nothing more, since I don't seem to command my own crew. That, I'm sure, is by the way that suits you best. Yeah. With this, he nonchalantly drew his hand from Antinous's hand, while the suitors, busy feasting in the halls, mocked and taunted him, flinging insults now. God help us, one young buck kept shouting. He wants to slaughter us all. 
He's off to Sandy Pillars to hire cutthroats. Even Sparta, perhaps. So hot to have our heads. Why, he drove as far as Ephyria's dark, rich soil and run back home with lethal poison. Slip it into the bowl and wipe us out with drink. Who knows? Another young blade up and ventured. Off in that hollow ship of his. He just might drown, far from his friends, a drifter like his father. What a bore! He double our work for us, splitting up his goods, passing out his house to his mother and the man who weds the queen. So they scoffed. But Telemachus, Telemachus, headed down to his father's store, broad and vaulted, piled high gold and bronze, chests packed with clothing, vats of redolent oil, and there, standing in close ranks against the wall, were jars of seasoned mellow wine, holding the drink unmixed inside them, fit for a god, waiting the day Odysseus, worn by hardship, might come home again. Doors, snugly fitted, doubly hung, were bolted shut, and a housekeeper was in charge by night and day, her care, her vigilance, guarding all those treasures. Eurycleia, the daughter of Ops, his and Ops son, Telemachus called her into the storeroom. Come, nurse, draw me off some wine in smaller travelling jars, mellow, the finest vintage you have been keeping, next to what you reserve for our unlucky king, in case Odysseus might drop him from the blue and cheat the deadly spirits, make it home. Fill me an even dozen, seal them tightly, pour me barley in well stitched leather bags, twenty measures of meal, your stone ground best, but no one else must know. These rations now, put them all together. I'll pick them up myself toward evening, just about the time that mother climbs to her room and thinks of turning in. I'm sailing off to Sparta, Sandy Pilos too, for news of my dear father's journey home. Perhaps I'll catch some more. Now, a commercial break. Loving the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. 
She's a girl with many quirky ways What she looks for is to fascinate To unveil you and derail you Come what may She won't give you time to hesitate what she looks for is to fascinate, to unveil you and derail you. Come what may, come what may. She'll give you love, 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 love in the Milky Way, love in the Milky Way. When you watch, she'll give you love, love. Love, love in the Milky Way, love in the Milky Way. She has bought a place in Budapest, and the clientele of their hostess. Oh, when she's smiling, she's beguiling. In her way, in her way She'll give you love, 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 love In the Milky Way, love in the Milky Way What you want, she'll give love, 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 love In the Milky, love in the Milky Way What she wants, she'll give you So they say, what you want, she'll give you. What you need, she'll give you love, 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 love. In the Milky Way, love in the Milky Way. Love, 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 love. In the Milky, love in the Milky Way. What you want, she'll give you.
no, no, you're doing it right, you keep doing it right, you never learn anything if you keep doing it right, do it again, and this time, do it wrong. And this is a retrospective, I feel like it's taken from a philosophical uh, website. It's called Nine Philosophical Razors. Occam's Razor, the simplest explanation is usually, but not always, the best. Sagan's so standard, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Hitchens Razor, what can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. Religion. <laughs> Hume's Razor, causes must be sufficiently able to produce the effect assigned to them. Duck Test, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, quacks like a duck, it might be a duck. Popper's falsifiability principle, for a theory to be considered scientific, it must be possible to dispute or refute it. Newton's flaming laser sword, if something cannot be settled by experiment, it's not worth debating. Grice's razor, address what the speaker actually meant instead of addressing the literal meaning of what they actually said. Requires interpretation, of course. <laughs> Handlin's razor, never attribute to malice that which can be adequately explained by incompetence or stupidity. Thank you. Hello again, gorgeous ones. I hope you are enjoying the open section as much as I am. Uh, we can now come to that very exciting time of the evening, our feature. And tonight's feature, of course, is the one and only Sean M. Whelan. Now, I met Sean in the late 1990s at Monsalfat Poetry Festival. And he had several people hanging around him at the time and I was watching because I'd heard about this Sean M. Whelan and I was curious and I thought, oh, I wouldn't mind seeing him. Uh, but I was in a very cheeky mood and I stood back and watched everything and waited till he was by himself and he was sitting in front of uh, the chapel, I think. And I walked over and sat down next to him, told him my name and said, so, are you arrogant or just shy? The look on his face, oh, I felt pretty mean actually. And he was really lovely about it. He, he looked up at me and he said, shy? And I was like, oh. And we had a bit of a chat and I heard his poetry and I thought he was absolutely wonderful. And he really is a nice man. And we've known each other and even performed on, at the same things. You know, ever since. So, uh, yeah, but Sean is actually a very talented man, and I'd like to say that he's an excellent DJ, uh, the only DJ ever to get Patrick Alexander up for a dance to run DMC. And here is the proof that's Patrick and my young self. And Sean was the DJ that night. And Patrick said, oh, I like this song. And up he got. And we had a really fun boogie down together. Yeah. And Sean is uh, 
also a marriage celebrant, which is kind of which is pretty appropriate because his poetry is so positive and full of love and quite romantic. Even even the little acidy trip stories that he writes sometimes with fluffy animals and boats in them, you know, it, 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 there's, there's something philosophical and loving in that work. He also has written about astronauts and astronomy and so many different things. I love his cowboy hat, uh, adore him, his work with musicians and he has a podcast. His podcast is called More Than A Will. I highly recommend that you look up Sean M. Whelan's podcast, More Than A Whelan, uh, because it's excellent and you should all subscribe. So, without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's feature, Mr. Sean M. Whelan. Hi, so it's like about two o'clock in the morning or something and I'm standing underneath um, my clothesline in the backyard. Why? Because I'm crazy, that's why. It seemed like a good idea at the time I started and then once I got halfway through, I was committed. Anyway, so this is a poem called I Am. It's an older poem of mine, but it's an updated isolation edition and will be accompanied by my Buddha box. I am, I am hot stinking decaying light. I'm the melting ice caps at the bottom of your whiskey glass. I am on the tip of the librarian's lips. I am that small purple bruise on your thigh that you have no recollection of receiving. I am the dust slowly gathering in the grooves of the record you left on the turntable overnight. I am the big, I am. I am that letter you never sent. I am the recession you had to have. I'm sorry about that. I am a grand design in danger of not being finished way over budget. I am the drawer full of Michael Jackson's unused left-handed gloves. I am the ground control to your major Tom. I am 33 dogs that can't even handle this right now. I am Grumpy Cat's secret smile when nobody else is around. I am very good at opening but terrible at closing. I am the lipstick you use to write upon your mirror. Here lies buried treasure. I am very good at opening but I'm terrible at closing. I am this far away from being this far away from you. I'm the grammar Nazi taking apart your status update. I'm concerned that the mission affects the word Nazi by being overused by people. I am a free floating, full torso, vaporous apparition. I can't walk through walls, but I can walk through trees. I have no explanation for that. I am the painting of the dying. I am the painting that the painting of Dorian Gray was painted over. I am that noise you make in your sleep when you turn over in bed. I am the jerk photobombing your family holiday snaps. I am the dick you drew in a Herald Sun. I am the books you never finish. I am less than certain, but I'm more than unsure. I am the submarine caught in the seaweed of your subtext. I am the cherished then deftly manipulated by Audrey Horne's tongue. I am the last hand you ever shook. I'm the last band you ever saw. We kind of sucked. Sorry about that. If we'd known, we would have rehearsed. I am the hug of your best friend that encircles you in your dreams at night. On good nights. I am an app that knows your every move. I have known your every move for quite some time. But don't worry, I care about you. I think. I am okay. 
We all need. We all will be. This is called I Am A DJ. I am a DJ. I am what I play. Like many things in my life, it was nothing I ever planned on becoming. I did it for kicks long enough until eventually it was something I felt comfortable calling myself. Although, like a lot of creatives, I often feel like I will be found out for being a fraud. Technically, I don't really have that many skills. But I've always thought it's not how you play, it's what you play that counts. People think I'm a social animal because I'm a DJ, but in fact, it's the exact opposite. Picture house parties in the 90s. Picture a guy who gets awkward in group situations, even around his best friends, and he has many friends, the most amazing friends he could hope for. A guy who just needs something to do at parties, who drowns under the weight of small talk, a guy who just needs to be of use. He gravitates towards the stereo. He takes control. He watches the party lift and sway and undulate. He doesn't have to talk to anybody, and yet he communicates to a crowd of people at the same time. These were conversations I could get used to, and I did. The role of DJ perfectly suited to the introvert slash extrovert. You shape the happiness of a room and you do it alone. Here I am now, DJing in a Fitzroy bar. The crowd is young, students mostly, in their early 20s. I play week after week, I know what they like. I know how to push their collective buttons. The view from the DJ booth is godlike. You are visible and invisible at the same time. I see couples get together and break up all in the space of one song. I see loners swaying on the perimeter of the dance floor, aching to get noticed by someone. Anyone, please notice me. I see the moment just before a fight is about to begin, and just as the first punch is swung, I completely kill the music and everything stops dead. Music is time, and when it stops, so does everyone else. I see lost loves from the past and the shadows on the dance floor, the same mannerisms, the silhouette, the way they move, and the smile, and the shake of a head. Is that you? Could that be you? And then they turn into light and the past fades to grey. At the bar where I play every week, directly below the DJ booth, is a basement room where the beer kegs are kept. Sometimes when I need a break and it's all a bit much, I put on a long song and I descend into the cool, quiet room. Often it's during Bohemian Rhapsody. A great song, a classic, never fails to unify the dance floor and yet I'm so fucking over it. I've just heard it too many times. I descend the stairs and I sit on a steel barrel. Right above my head, the chaos of the dance floor rumbles like a thunderstorm. I can still hear the music, but it's muted and distant. In the corner of the basement room, I see a movement in the shadows. And there it is. My earliest memory, a faceless man in a full black body stocking, wearing a glittery black bowler hat, swaying slightly to and fro hands, palms out, uncertain as whether to give or to receive. I remember it as a nightmare, but only because of the fear of not knowing what it meant. Behind the black stocking covered face, I can see the lips moving ever so slightly as if he's trying to tell me something. And he has been trying to tell me something all of my life. Upstairs, I can hear Freddie Mercury drawing a song to a close. Nothing really matters to me. I must return to the surface to cue the next track, but when I climb up the ladder, I'm not in the bar anymore. 
I ascend into my family living room. My late father is standing by the stereo with his back to me. I see him take a record and place it on the turntable. I see him so ever gently place the needle onto the wax. It's Frank Sinatra. Fly me to the moon. My father turns to me. His face is clean and pure. And his smile is as bright as a disco ball. The size of a sun. Dream Machines. I wrote this from a place in the future. A place where I could sit down here and hear newspapers talk through the birds outside my window. And from here, I was looking back to see if you were looking back at me to see me looking back at you. The thing about the future is, it's not what it used to be. And the present is an expired gift voucher from a chain of galactic department stores long for closed on. Today, I purchased illegal fireworks from a man who hasn't even been invented yet. And tonight I set them off in the yard to give your smile the light it deserves. Your face fell in and out of shadow while the sky kept having the most amazing ideas about us. You gave me a miniature city to tend to like a tiny garden of civilization. And you told me if the city survived, then so would we. So, he said, you better look after it then. And I could still see the distant echoing of embers bouncing around the corners of your eyes. I took to my miniature city like a duck to mortar. Heart-shaped circuits, rivers of tears, state parks of doubt, skyscrapers of hope, bus shelters of mercy, public toilets of indiscretion, bars of ambivalence, and tiny, sacred, suburban houses of devotion. And speaking of houses, I'm at your house right now. Call me. I know you don't have a landline. No need. I had crystal rocks surgically implanted into my palms. I can receive you any time of it does cost me more in karmic currency for roaming. In the present, I am not perfect. In the future, that didn't change. So I built a buffer between me and human frailty in the form of robotic sentries. They take the heat out of my every sin. I watch them circle the house, becoming a thought before I think it. And now, to be alone with you has never been so fearless. Let's gather the teeth we've shed through a lack of hunger and build a memorial to everything that we didn't consume. And then let's turn all these dials up to 11 and we'll drown out the sound of time, that infernal tick-tick-tocking of desire for any place but here. And we'll set the controls for the heart of the pun. Where exactly is heaven on this map? Is it past zone two? Ticket inspectors as archangels? I know that heaven used to lie in that tiny heated space between your hip and the palm of my hand, completely reverent and infinitesimal. But then it slipped and spun away. We took our eyes off the prize because we didn't know what the prize was anymore. And now, the signposts point towards thought, energy, atom, matter. I follow each one like a demented Dorothy, but no posse for backup, no yellow brick tollway, no red glitter to pimp my ride. Instead, I took the heart and the straw and the tin and the fur and the courage and the brains and 
and I built the machines. The machines for dreaming. Cathedrals of chaos, temples of temerity. And now, tomorrow, we'll be fine. I can't wait to see your face when you finally turn up. And I should know these things. Because I'm already there. I want to kiss every cloud, thank every bird on the wire and the horizon, the visual chorus of the afternoon, a gift that unwraps before me, changing and invaluable. It has been foretold about the evil of your ways. That sinful curse you inflict upon your prey. The devoted lust that leads me astray by the devil's blood that flows through your veins. Heaven's thunder in your wake. Or to fall down to your knees. The wellers quiver under your wrath. Or devoured by their sins. I always fall down to your bidding. Assisting in your unholy crimes. With a body like that, the pleasure's all mine. A simple touch, angels weep. All I want is only skin deep. I go in for the kill, against my will. For your evil eyes, get me every time. I cannot resist your will. Your magnetism drives me insane. Now you have me on your side. The world shall never be the same. I lost my soul to the Lord of Fire. I lost my dreams to your desire. I lost my hope. Now it's all in you. As I crave to touch your devil's skin. I see you. I see more than you know. You're in a dark place. That feeling of not knowing how you feel. The repressed emotions kept hidden, but keep showing in your face. Subtle comments make me aware of it. It is revealed in your attitude, but you don't want to show it. You have no words to describe it. You are trying to look past it, hoping in anticipation that it passes sooner. But it is not passing. You are afraid it will never happen. It will remain. You had an epiphany. But you realised it was years too late. That you missed the boat when you had the chance. A ship you had not boarded as you did not see how. But you since realised that you had already had the chance. You saw there was no second chance. But you tried to warn others who still do. They won't listen. And that's their choice. And you realise this. You feel you discovered a meaning of life that is their des discovery to make. That is a base to cover just in case, as you feel like the walking dead. That you lost a chance of immortality, a part of you that wanted to go on. But you lost that. You let that go, and you feel you failed. You're middle-aged now. Allegedly somewhere that you feel in a halfway point. You realise you may have just as long to live again. The emptiness you discovered will stay with you for the rest of that time. But it's not about you. That's how you see it. That's how you feel you have let others down. By murdering those who have never existed. By destroying their chance to be. Last night I dreamt of you. There were trails of tears down your face, but you had stopped crying. You're in search of escape, somewhere you can't be traced, where they can't hurt you anymore. Why do they say those things? I try to reassure you that you're better than them. They say those lies to get on top of you, but not to worry about them because you're stronger than that. You kept thanking me, but somehow my words seem not enough. Last night I dreamt of you. I could sense fear in your presence. I could see in your eyes you felt over the edge. 
They said so many things about you. They're all lies. There's no way they could be true. You kept reassuring yourself of this, but somehow some things caused you doubt. Maybe some are true. Maybe you just hadn't realised. Maybe you didn't notice at the time. Maybe not completely true, but loosely based from the truth. I notice these thoughts grow. They swelled in you just like that feeling was. That lost, lonely feeling. That was becoming too strong. Way too strong. You desperately needed a release. I could sense what you needed to do. I tried to reach out to you, to plead for you to turn back. Instead, you begged me to help you to escape. I could not do this for you. You hated me for this, but still, you understood. Then somehow, you slipped right through. Eventually, there was no stopping you. Last night, I dreamt of you. Somehow, that dream was true. That was the last I saw you. Breaking the rules, defying the regime, ignoring establishment, denying the blame, justifying actions, defying right from wrong, renegotiating boundaries against censorship strong, well under siege, dictators attack full force, a very profitable cause, rejecting recourse, locked in a cell, still defying the blame, fighting for freedom, foreign dictatorship reigns, treading the edge of fictitious crimes, supporting empowerment, crossing the line, treading the edge, a now political pledge, battling for dictation, you shan't decline. Hi everyone. Hi Lish. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm going to read two poems for the open mic. One about the situation currently that we're all experiencing, social distancing, and one from my book, Loud and Read. So I'll start off with the new normal. Saturday night and I prepare for our catch up. A cocktail glass stands ready in enthusiasm. A double shot vodka, Cointreau, cranberry juice and a hint of lime. A smoke filled room encased in laughter and music, in my mind from another time. In the background, Alicia Keys sings about leaving Brooklyn and being inspired by bright lights, Empire State of Mind. I throw my never worn damson pantsuit on the white cotton sheets, choose an elegant Mickey Moto pearl necklace and earrings. Mismatched, they make for a funky ensemble. 23 minutes to seven, I gulp the drink and pour another. Months ago, an $18 Cosmo would have sufficed. Now, two for one at bottle shops and free delivery make it cocktail paradise. The heat iron as I apply a purple hue to my eyes and mulberry red lipstick. My bunny soft slippers are on standby near the laptop. My recent book purchases stacked for show and tell. 12 minutes to seven and my hair still looks frizzy. Five minutes to go, I get into my outfit, slip on my heels, pour another drink. My hair is as straight as it's going to get. I could always use a Snapchat filter. I enter Zoom, pout and wait for Laura to start the meeting. I hear the whir of a mini drone outside my window. This is the new normal connection. Okay, and now I'm going to read one from my book. And I'm going to go with Monochrome City as a bit of a tribute to New York. This city will screw you over. Advice comes in a yellow bubble. A man with an ashen smile. To live here is hell. Transaction is interaction. A dizzying speed, green confetti conceals. I become colour blind. Billboards rush toward me. Sun shines at strange angles, skies closer to the ground. Over and over and over in my head. You're welcome, you're welcome. Along the high line, pleating serenity in the chaos. Around me, in black and white, a child releases a balloon. Okay, thank you. Bye. So, 
another poetry perspective online comes to an end. First, let me say thank you to all our viewers for tuning in tonight and I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did, or me at least. And thank you, Sean and Whelan, for your amazing poetry. It was absolutely wonderful. I enjoyed it immensely. And of course, thank you to all the contributors in the open section who sent us footage and went out of their way to contribute. It's so important to keep art alive at this time and to appreciate the beauty around us and stay connected. Uh, speaking of our next poetry perspective, we'll have the magnificent Helen Bradwell. Helen Bradwell has been a regular coming to part of our Footscray poetry perspective for some time now, so very delighted and excited to have her featuring on May the 5th. So be sure to tune in to the YouTube channel for that. And if you would like to be in the open section, uh, send your video submissions to us. Uh, the details will be on the Poetry Perspective page. And if you just need a time out, go to the Poetry Perspective YouTube channel and check out some of the video from past performances. There's heaps to choose from and a variety of things, poetry, music, theatrics, it's great. So, again, thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed. Stay safe. This is Lish, signing off.